the life of Saint Irene of Chrysovalanthu, translated by Hero Deacon Philaratos. Saint Irene Chrysovalanthu flourished after the death of the greedy Emperor the Theophilus I. After Theophilus's death, his spouse, the most reverent and God-loving Theod Theodora, took the throne. The Empress Theodora supported the Orthodox faith and re-established the veneration of the holy icons, as was the tradition of the Orthodox Church. The Empress Theodora was reigning in, in place of her son Michael, who was not yet of age to assume rule of the empire. When Michael was 12 years old, Theodora sought to find him a suitable wife. She sent her scouts on a mission to find a beautiful girl who was noble as well as virtuous and worthy of becoming an empress. In the land of Cappadoc Cappadocia, there lived such a beautiful girl and of great virtue. She was the daughter of noble parents and her name was Irene. The scouts knew of Irene's virtue and beauty and quickly took her to the empress in the hope that she would one day become empress herself. Irene had one sister who was taken as wife by the empress's brother Vardis. As the scouts escorted the fair Irene to Byzantium, they neared Olympus. Irene had heard of a man that lived an extremely ascetical life on Mount Olympus named Ioannakios, Ioannakios the Great, and knowing that he was a holy man, she very much desired to see him. She begged the scouts to lead her to the saint so that she, she may receive his blessing. The spies finally agreed, but Saint Ioannikios only but Saint Ioannikios only appeared to those worthy in heart. Upon their approach, Saint Ioannikios recognized the spiritual, the spiritual progress of the young girl and exclaimed, Welcome, servant of God Irene. Go to the capital and rejoice, for the convent of Chrysovalantu needs you to shepherd her virgins. Upon hearing this, Irene was quite amazed that the holy man even knew her destiny, let alone her name. She therefore fell to his feet and praised him. Before she set on her way, Saint Ioannikios gave her spiritual advice to strengthen her. When Irene finally arrived at the capital, her relatives, who lived in the city, came to greet her. They all had their own ranks among others in the kingdom. They came forward with some of their noble friends and greeted her with much honour, as was truly, truly due to her. The king of kings, who called all things from nothingness into being, provided that the earthly king had chosen another girl to be his bride several days before Irene even arrived. Irene was not in the least upset by this, but rather, she gave thanks to God that he enlightened the king to choose another wife. Many other noblemen and leaders, the richest men of Constantinople, sought to make Irene their wife because of her beauty and nobility. However, she desired no other bridegroom than the heavenly bridegroom. She all wisely rejected all the temporal and earthly things and sought a place to pass her life peacefully and pleasingly to God. So remembering the words of Saint Ioannikios the Great, she sent people to visit the convent of Chrysovalandu so that she might know what it was what it was like. They found that the convent of Chrysovalandu was in was it was in a quite beautiful and quiet place with a surprisingly good community of nuns. Upon hearing of the convent's good fame, Saint Irene rejoiced and gave to the poor not only all the expensive clothes that her parents had given her, but also all the priceless things the queen had bestowed upon her. She then freed all of her servants and slaves, cut her long golden hair and entered the convent of Chrysovalandu with all eagerness. Irene effectively abandoned every worldly vanity and every worldly way of thinking. She, the tender, noble and most beautiful, dressed herself in a habit of animal hair and rejoiced as she took up the light yoke of Christ, the anointed one and most sweet. She subjected herself to all the sisters with amazing humility and served all the needs of the convent with great care and tirelessness without ever contradicting. She never considered that she was trying brightly and in her soul she had compunction and happiness. The abbess of the convent was a woman of great virtue for this abbess was a struggler at the spiritual trials and always advised towards good works. Irene had the grace of God which had mystically descended upon her. 
This same grace taught her what was of benefit for her soul, for without this grace, as the Lord himself says, man can do no good. Without me you can do nothing, but the one who lives in me and I in him, this one brings forth much fruit. Thus this ever memorable one, as good and fertile earth, brought forth Christ, brought forth fruit to Christ, and was pleasing in the eyes of God, and in the eyes of the entire sisterhood of the convent, and all were amazed by her. Such was the trust that Irene had gained, that she was made the treasurer and purchaser of the monastery, and was given the care of the silver pieces of the convent. She was obedient to all, displayed great humility, and never scandalized or hurt any of the sisters. She was well loved and respected by all of the nuns. Irene was not only very capable of all her physical duties, but more so of all her spiritual duties. She was never missing from the church services, and in her cell she would read the lives of venerable monastics in order, in order to imitate their lives and to teach the sisters and incite them to similar endeavours. One day she was reading the life of Saint Arsenios the Great and learned that he remained awake until the morning hours praying. She too desired to perform this act, and so she sought permission from the abbess to also practice this spiritual struggle. The abbess at first hesitated to give Irene her blessing to perform this ascetic act, fearing that she might become ill from overexhaustion. But seeing her eagerness and knowing her humility and her stability, she blessed Irene to carry out this ascetical practice. Irene began this superhuman struggle even though she had not lived in the monastery for one year. The grace of God, however, gave her strength, and she would stand from evening until morning with her hands lifted up as Moses and praying to God. Many other times she would do the same from morning until sunrise, and other times she would stand in prayer all day and night. The abbess was all the more impressed by Irene's progress. When three years had passed from the day St. Irene began this great ascetical struggle, the hater of all good, the devil himself, saw her great struggles and sought to trap her in a transgression. He was, however, unsuccessful. St. Irene had not succumbed to the passions and had so much given up care for her flesh for the sake of her soul that she rejected and totally despised all physical things, food, glory, money, clothes, etc. She possessed only one habit. She would wear her habit for the first time on Pascha and continue with it for one full year without taking it off or ever washing it. When Pascha would come, she would put on the new one and give the old one to the poor. Her diet consisted of bread and water once a day and perhaps some herbs. She was not prone to vainglory and had totally forgotten her noble upbringing. The demon who was unsuccessful at, an, at inciting St. Irene to commit a sin at all sowed forth discord in Irene's mind by reminding her of the pleasure of her former life and stirring her with carnal desires. The man-hating one in vain tortured her, for she recognised his attack all too well and she confessed his attempts to her abbess so that she would, she would be delivered from the temptation of this demon and she continued her struggles as before. One night as she was praying as usual, a demon took the form of a very ugly black man and stood from a distance and stood from a distance while insulting her, trying, uh, trying the weak one that he is, to instill a terror in the servant of God. The demon said to her, "You fortune teller and ill-fated woman, against me do you, against me do you battle without realizing what I am and how great my strength is." These and other insults did the all-conniving one say to her, but our saint of God made the sign of the cross and the demon disappeared immediately. One day after another, Saint Irene was plagued with dark imaginations. Even though they deeply disturbed her, she, the courageous one, waged battle against the passions of the flesh and was triumphant. She would often fall to the ground and pray with tears to the Lord. She often called upon the all-powerful Theotokos for help and to the archangels Michael and Gabriel, to whom the monastery's church was dedicated. She also called out for assurance to all the heavenly saints so that they might rescue her from the snares and unclean suggestions of the demons. Saint Irene prayed using these words, <clears throat> All Holy Trinity, all powerful, through the intercessions of the Theotokos and the supplications of the archangels Michael and Gabriel, 
and all the heavenly powers and all the saints, help your servant and deliver me from the assault of this demon. In this way, our Holy Mother prayed many days and nights until divine illumination descended on her from above and overshadowed her soul and drove out all the evil imaginings, leaving the saint unbothered so that she began even greater ascetical struggles and more eagerly labored for God. Whoever beheld this saint of God, Saint Irene, saw in her great and holy desire and her, uh, and her many God-given graces. She had become a chosen vessel, as the great Saint Paul says, and a container of the Holy Spirit, having abiding in her soul the living Christ. She was no longer living according to the flesh, but for Christ in spirit while Christ lived in her, as the Holy Apostle writes. In this way, Saint Irene became totally enlightened and led many souls towards the light of truth. It came to pass that people of all classes would run to her in numbers. Diligently, she taught and advised with prudence and sweetness. Suddenly, however, the abbess of the monastery became very ill. All the nuns mourned in their cells, for they knew that she had reached the end of her earthly life. Since the abbess was so virtuous, they were grieved by her impending departure. The nuns mourned, but the humble Irene mourned ever so much. The dying abbess said to them with all meekness, Don't be sad about me, for you have a good abbess more capable and more wise than I, and to her be, be ye all obedient with your whole soul. I am speaking about Irene, the daughter of light, the Lamb of God, the vessel of the all Holy Spirit, and do not choose for yourselves any leader other than Irene. The blessed abbess, having reached her last hour, said to her master, Glory to your mercy, O Lord as she gave up her soul to the angelic hands that were awaiting her. The venerable Irene was not present when the abbess departed from the earthly world. Likewise, none of the nuns told Irene what the abbess had said, for knowing Irene's great humility and how she turned away from vainglory, they feared that she might leave the convent if she heard such words. Therefore, they buried the deceased abbot, uh, sorry, they buried the deceased abbess as it was fitting and they proceeded to the church that God might enlighten them. Um, we might pause here. Um, Vespulta, do you have any um, anything that your grace wants to um, talk about from what we just read? Glory to God. Sometimes we start out on another, um, for another destination, and even for perhaps being the head of an earthly kingdom like um, San Irene almost was, but um, God has better spiritual plans for us. We can only thank God for everything that is and everything that isn't, for everything that came to be and for everything that didn't come to be because there was something better for us. So she went She went from having like literally the best earthly opportunity that a woman could conceive of to be the, the empress of 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 the Roman Empire, um, was 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 Constantinople the Roman the head of the Roman Empire at that time, Vespulta? Yes, it was. It was the head of the the Eastern Roman Empire, and it was certainly a, a good place to be. And in her time, it was the most powerful kingdom. The the Western Roman Empire had already had its fall and was on its own earth way down. And the Eastern Roman Empire was still strong at the time of St. Irene. Uh, the convent of Christopher Valando, by the way, is was one of many monasteries and convents that were right in the city of Constantinople, just like the famed monastery Studio the Studium. Um, it might sound like the most ascetic place, but it was right in the city of Constantinople, like the convents of Panachrandos and Pamakaristos. This, in the same way, was Christovalando uh, convent. The only thing is that we don't um, know today where exactly inside the city of Constantinople was the convent of Christovalando. It's been lost. So, um, obviously to to it's a it's a much higher calling to become a monastic than to to become a even an orthodox um uh, ruler is that is that correct Esputa? yes it's a lot better for your soul and then again the soul is is the 
what do you call it the the scale for everything if something's good for your soul then it's worth more than everything else in the world so is it's is it true to say that there's no there's no earthly there's no earthly duty which could compare in, in terms of uh, what's good for for your eternal future as any duty that you could perform for the church even doing something simple like sweeping the uh, the floors of the temple exactly exactly this but did, does your grace have anything is there anything that your grace wants to reinforce from what we read i mean we read about how when she first came into the convent she was completely amazing with how pleasing she was to everyone how she served everyone is there anything and i'm kind of drawing a blank on what happened after that but um was there anything that your grace kind of wanted to highlight and and maybe translate if there's um um to to our laymen that are listening um if your grace thinks there is anything worth translating um no i think everything's been said quite well um to, so let's let's go to constantine and anna and anna do we have any questions or comments from um from our listeners our lay people our brothers and sisters in christ the the life of santa irene is so interesting especially for a, a, a totally uh, uh, for her devotedness which is uh, which reminds me uh, some memory of egypt uh, that kind of complete uh, uh gift of herself so i don't know if you agree but it's uh, so beautiful so fantastic and so inspiring yeah I think, i think that's right there's it's from what we're reading there's there's nothing that she had that she didn't give to god or her neighbor um uh, Despita, does your grace have any comment on that um i don't know if your grace heard what constantine said is constantine said it's uh, her example is so inspiring it's like saint mary of egypt that she she gave everything for christ yes she um she found her her divine bridegroom and she didn't care if someone was offering her a bridegroom that was uh the emperor uh anyway by the time she got there god had already figured out um that uh another woman had been selected to be um the empress of the the roman empire which um was the only thing that was left big in the world uh, as we said in in the 5th century the the western roman empire had dissolved and by this time what would we would call the byzantine empire was the strong uh, empire of that time and she didn't really care um this is the sign of a monastic mm -hmm. who, who is on fire for Christ and even if you offer him or her the biggest treasures of the world then nothing compared uh to the love of the bridegroom right the the other thing i want to ask your grace about we all have you no know, we have our, we have deeds we have our words we have our thoughts is it possible to be saved you know some of us have got uh hmm i don't know if there's a, there's something i hmm i'm not going to say what i was going to say but okay but some of us have got uh, let's say opinions on on things something like politics for example i don't want to go into politics but many of us have got political opinions um is it possible to be saved if we don't give up everything uh, everything all of our feelings all of our thoughts all of our words that we like that we hold dear to us um if they conflict with orthodoxy and we refuse to give these things up attitudes beliefs is it possible possible to be saved despota everybody has something to say about their opinion in my opinion um i've been reading these last two days about even the matter of um of abortions which anyone can easily see that archbishop archbishop supposedly archbishop el pido foros uh which means bringing hope which i think he's the opposite of what his name means uh el pido foros of america is basically saying that um 
it's okay to be pro-life, but it's okay to be um, to respect a woman's choice. So that our opinion has um, become more strong than what the church teaches. No, a good Orthodox Christian on any matter that there's been dogmatical discussion, um, he should have no opinion different from the church. My opinion on this, my opinion of this is what the church has always believed. I can't have another opinion. It's not correct for me to believe something different from what the church teaches because I'm a member of that. I draw my life from that church and I certainly can't be going around um, holding something that's my opinion. And why would I have my own opinion? Why would I as a sinful individual have an opinion of his own? Because um, I want myself to be the center of the whole universe. And so my opinion is very important because I thought it up, I believe it, and I want to pass it on to other people. No, in all these cases, we have to have the mind, the opinion, they're the same thing, actually, the mind of the church. What does the church teach on this? What did the fathers teach on this? What has been the um, historical thoughts on this? So, okay, so obviously your grace has just said, so for matters that are dogmatic, it's it's unacceptable for an, for any Orthodox Christian to have opinions that differ from from the mind of the church, from the opinions of the church. Um, what sort of opinions, are there any opinions that are actually good um, that aren't to do with dogma, dogmas that uh, for Orthodox Christians to have? Um, Constantine and Anna, you know, they've, they have uh, three children. You know, I'm thinking it's good for their children to be of the opinion that they like mum's cooking. Um, what are there, is there any such thing as good opinions um, for people to have? Yes, in our everyday life, we should have opinions and they're correct to have. And of course, they shouldn't be a stomping ground for other people's opinions. Um, we should be able to express our opinion and not feel um, so in, um, harmed by the opinion of others, but um, that only has to do with things of everyday life and things that are not matters of dogma and morality, because the church over right. the centuries has been very clear on morality, um, like the, the mention of abortion that I made before. I mean, if you think uh, there are actually um, mentions of abortion, in um, the works of the fathers. But uh, if we want to put it much simpler, uh, is there anyone who can really believe that uh, murder is not um, a moral offense? It's one of those things, murder at least, is one of those things that I think the conscience in all human beings, whether they have a religion or not, their conscience uh, cries out against murder. However, we've managed to convince ourselves in some cases, well, some people have convinced themselves that uh, the fetus in the womb does not um, have the status of a human being. And so murdering that fetus is not murdering a, a real person. It's murdering, I don't know what uh, the people who are mm. pro-abortion think the fetus is. Um, Constantine and, and Anna and Anna and Athens, do we have any any anything further that any other comments or questions not from me yeah. it's just amazing at such a young age that she was already you know living such a spiritual life that the abbess um, wanted her to take her place after she reposed that in itself is quite incredible and the fact that she was she was praying all night like moses after being in the monastery for less than a year like real miraculous ascetical feats uh, Constantine, were you saying something? Were you was there something you wanted to say? Oh, we just wanted to know uh, what do uh, her uh, relics repose in this moment? We never knew where her relics were, and there were no relics at all. Suddenly, in the last twenty years, um, some of the so-called true Orthodox of Greece have started to proclaim 
pieces of her relics. They never tell us though where they were found or how they were found. Since we don't even know where the monastery was, we certainly don't know where her her grave right. was. Um, so I'm very skeptical about these relics. Um, I imagine God hasn't made us worthy to find them. If someone did want to go to on a spiritual pilgrimage to somewhere somewhere they could venerate Saint Irene, what would be the best place to go there, Sulta? Um, I think her convent in Likovrishi. It was founded um, as the monastery of the Holy Archangels and um, the then elder Paisu has nothing to do with that guy from Manathos that's been dead in the last, um, during our days, that died in during our days, um, but by an uh, old uh, clergyman, uh, uh, genuine Orthodox Christian who gave the icon uh, to the monastery and miracles be, uh, began to be um, performed there. So I think it's it's her miraculous place, um, the monastery of um, Krishovalandu in Likovrishi outside of Athens. Okay, this is the one that's not too far from the airport, there, Spoto? Um, yes, it's... Um, it's about um, 25 kilometers north of Athens. Okay. 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 Thank you, Thank you uh Constantine and Anna, anything else? Well, it, that was exactly what we wanted to know. Um, oh, I, actually, I, I I can understand what uh, uh, um, Vladika said about uh, all the uh, all those uh, uh, fake relics uh, because we. We are from Rome, so we we know we know those things uh, since centuries. So. Right. Thank right. you very much. Very touching um, life of um, Saint Irene. We'll we'll just read another. We'll read another ten minutes or so, and then um, we'll stop again. Therefore, they buried the deceased abbess as it was fitting, and they proceeded to the church that God might enlighten them. At that time, the confessor of the faith, Methodius, was patriarch of Constantinople. During the iconoclastic controversy, this holy patriarch had endured many tortures and bore on his body the marks of the price he paid for holy orthodoxy. Truly, he possessed the Holy Spirit, and he was able to know the future. When the other sisters were ready to depart for a visit to the patriarch, Irene did not want to go with them, and she found an assortment of reasons and obstacles not to go. The nuns, however, managed to force Irene along. When they had arrived and had received the patriarch's blessing, he asked them which of all the nuns they had considered for the new abbess. They replied that they had chosen no one, but, ra but rather they had put their trust first in God and in his holiness, the patriarch, as he possessed the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was asked to make the decision for the Holy Spirit. For the, sorry, therefore, he was asked to make the decision for the Holy Spirit would guide him. The God-bearer then responded that he knew that all the nuns wanted the honourable and pure Irene, and that their opinion was good and pleasing to God. The patriarch gave thanks to God that he had revealed to him the virtuous acts of his handmaid Irene. The sisters were amazed and venerated him by saying, Truly God dwells in your righteous soul, and he enlightens you and makes the hidden things known unto you. Immediately the saintly patriarch arose from his throne, and singing the, the required hymns, incensing and blessing the Lord, he ordained Irene a, a deaconess of the great church, knowing by the Holy Spirit that she was clean. He later read over her the prayers of the installation of an abbess. He then instructed her on how to proceed in guiding the sisters in the way of salvation and peace. He blessed Irene as well as the sisterhood and sent them on their way back to their convent. Irene cried long and hard. She felt unworthy of such a position. The sisters tried to comfort her by saying to her, Don't feel sad that you have been assigned our protection, for we will always remain obedient to you, and we will help you in all godly endeavours as much as we are able. When they arrived at the convent, they gave thanks to God and escorted Irene to the cell of the abbess. Irene cried on. She closed the door of her new cell and fell on her face. Master Lord Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, our Guide and Teacher, 
Help your handmaid in this your small sheepfold, and deliver us from the grasp of the noetic wolf. For you know our weakness, and that we are not able to do anything good without your help and grace. She had prayed to the Lord in this manner for a long time, and addressed herself by saying, And you, lowly Irene, perhaps you realize what a burden Christ has placed on your shoulders. You take the responsibility for souls for which God took flesh and became man and shed his all holy and all precious blood. If you allow one soul to be lost, you will answer to God for this on the judgment day. You will receive hell as your reward for having taken on yourself the care of so many souls if you are careless and one of these souls is condemned. The Lord himself says that the soul is worth more than the whole world. Therefore, hold vigil, fast, pray, and be careful that from today on that your own fault does not become cause for one of the sisters to lose her soul, so that the words of Christ that say, a blind man leading a blind man causes the two to fall into a pit, may not be fulfilled in you. Irene struggled ever harder and spent many days praying and fasting. She would also spend the night kneeling and making many prostrations. She never, she never gave rest to her body, so that the Lord, seeing her many struggles, might be merciful to her and give her wisdom to guide her flock, her flock God-pleasingly. According to her desire, the Lord gave her such uh, sorry, according to her desire, the Lord gave her much wisdom, and she was praiseworthy in guiding the sisters. She taught and, and taught with wisdom surpassing the great teachers and rhetoricians. Below is a small selection of some of her precepts and admonitions. I know well, sisters in Christ, and honor, honorable offerings to God, that it is neither proper nor blessed that I, the unworthy and, and uneducated, should teach you. But because the mercies of God are unfathomable and incomprehensible, his grace established that I should be your superior. I, your worthless servant, beg you to obey me and to listen to the words of my lowliness. When we don't keep the rule, sorry, I just lost my spot. When we don't keep the rules and orders of this schema which we wear, and we don't do that which we promise before God and angels, we are of no benefit, just as faith without works is dead, as we have heard. Christ has promised us, for the small amount of fatigue that we endure here in this transient life, to give us the kingdom of the heavens and unending life, delight and eternal pleasure. It was for Christ that, having believed in him as we should, we left the charms of this world as being false and passing, in order to inherit those true and eternal things. If, therefore, we don't keep the commandments of the Lord, wretched and miserable that we are, then we will lose these, these transient things, along with the eternal things like the unwise virgins. We will be truly unworthy and foolish. Since the soul cannot be divided into two parts, one that seeks delights and one that seeks temperance, one that is haughty and one that is humble, we must totally hate all of our failings and toil to dispel from our soul every worldly desire so that our internal state resembles our external state and we may work on attaining all the other virtues. Remember that the virtues of the soul are preferable to the virtues of the body. Fasting and vigils and the other hardships of the body do not benefit us so much when the virtues of the spirit are lacking. The virtues of the spirit are humility, love, understanding, Arms giving to the poor, and all the other good and God pleasing acts. After all of these things, let us also work on the virtues of the flesh and let us fast as much as possible. These and other such and these and other such as these were Saint Irene advising her flock with motherly affection. Her spiritual children would eagerly accept everything she would tell them, and they brought forth much, much spiritual fruit. Our venerable mother Irene, seeing that her counsel brought forth much reward to the souls of the sisters, rejoiced and thanked the Lord, whom she loved with all of her soul and strength. Having in God unshakable faith and immeasurable love for the sisters, Saint Irene dared to ask of God a great and supernatural, supernatural gift, the gift of spiritual clairvoyance. Wow. She desired to be able to know the secret transgressions of all the sisters, not out of human curiosity, but in order to correct them so that not even one, one be condemned to hell. 
we're gonna we're gonna pause here. That'll be that'll be as far as we go tonight. Um, there, Spitter, is your grace is your grace with us? Yes, I'm here. Uh, it certainly is odd for someone, perhaps seems odd for someone to ask for the spiritual clairvoyance, but Saint Irene uh, was a mother. She was a mother to her flock, and she wanted um, uh, to be able to help her her daughters in Christ the best she could. So she asked this favor of God, and. Uh, God was not slow to answer his faithful servant. Is that something, uh, obviously, uh, if, if someone like me or uh, uh, your, your typical Orthodox Christian, if, if they ask God for some sort of charismatic gift of the Holy Spirit, um, we normally wouldn't expect to be given it. What are the, what are the kinds of prayers, Despota, that God is going to answer quickly? That, um, or that God is going to give us, um, um, I don't want to say answer quickly as if God doesn't answer all prayers, um, uh, but hopefully your grace understands what I'm getting at. Yes, the the answer to this for most people would be a big no, but for someone um, that was already from a young age such spiritually advanced, um, God said yes. So... And she didn't ask for it out of haughtiness of heart. I'm sure if anyone else of us asked for the gift of clairvoyance, then we would be doing it out of pride and thinking that um, we're capable of uh, such great deeds. For our parishioners who are living in the world, Despota, what are the types of things that they should be asking for in their prayer? And what are the things that they shouldn't be asking for? Enlighten my darkness, the best prayer for anyone. Asking Christ to enlighten those parts of us that are dark and away from the knowledge of Christ. And this is what St. Gregory Palamas was praying constantly. Is that is that correct? Is that correct? Yes, those are the words of St. Gregory Palamas. Uh, we'll go now to Constantine and Anna and uh, also Anna in Athens. Do we have... Any questions or comments? We surely, surely will uh, uh, will we'll do this prayer uh, because we we need it. We need so much the help of God in every step of our life, especially with a numerous family. That uh, we we thank uh, we thank Badika very much for for uh, his advice. Thank you, thank you, Constantine. Uh, Anna in Athens, is there anything that you want to add? I just I can't help but think that that would have been an enormous burden for St. Irene to have that gift given to her. But um, that speaks volumes for the person that she was, I guess. This this brings up exactly, another question that I... Know, that, was, that was what it was, a very big burden, like the spiritual gifts for those who really uh, can accept them, they are burdens. That's what's it. There are certain times in all of our lives where it seems manifest that God has opened certain doors for us. He's answered certain prayers that we've, we felt we really needed, needed to be answered. He's, it's feel, there are certain times where it seems manifest God has given us something incredibly valuable What's the, what's the what's the correct way for an Orthodox Christian to respond when they have that feeling, that awareness? What would it be like if someone you barely know turns around and gives you a million dollars? Uh, you would, if you're logical, if you're a logical person, you would know that you're not worthy of it. But then you would. Think you would be thankful for receiving it. Uh, this is when God gives us something that we didn't earn uh, because we're not um, in any position to earn any spiritual gifts, but we thank God for it. And as Anna pointed out, um, if it has 
a burden on us, a spiritual burden, then we have to lift up that cross too. Right. So we have to we have to accept that God has has made our cross a little bit heavier and carry it. And then there's a follow-up question here. What happens when God makes our cross a little bit heavier and we're not happy with that? And so we put the cross down and we say, I'm not going to carry it. Mm, if we're not worthy of the lighter cross, then we'll have to be waiting for the bigger cross. And if we don't accept that, uh, then we're leaving behind our salvation. Don't carry your cross and there's no salvation. Whoever wants to follow me, um, let him take up his cross and follow me. That's what Christ says. So if we, any for any of us, any time we decide to... Oh, sorry, that's what I... Denying ourselves is, is something very difficult. So the any time we put down our cross, we know that in the future, if we want to pick up our cross again, it's going to be a lot heavier because we put we, because we put the, the old one down. And if we never refuse to, if we never accept to pick up our cross again, we're giving up our salvation. Exactly. Thank you, Despota. We're going to end the recording here.